My name is Rana Faruhar. I'm the Assistant Managing Editor in charge of Economics and Business for Time Magazine. Uh, our cover story this week, as you may have seen, is on mobility and opportunity, so I hope you all will take a look at that. And I'm very honored and excited to be uh, moderating this panel today. We've got uh, a number of very expert panelists who are coming from a lot of different perspectives in the public sector, in the private sector, employers, folks that have been through training programs, so we've got a lot of great points of view on offer. I'm going to very quickly, in just sort of one minute here, um, set the scene for the discussion, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to spend no more than 30 seconds each uh, just introducing themselves, saying uh, where they come from and, and what their point of view is on this issue. Um, the discussion today is, of course, focused on this, this key set of statistics. There are 14 million unemployed Americans right now, but 53% of job creators and employers say that they can't find the skills that they need. So there is this huge uh, juxtaposition there, a bifurcation, as there is in so many areas of our economy between what's on offer and what's needed. Um, and clearly, the recession has especially hit uh, young people. Youth unemployment is, is in the double digits in some cases. It's higher than the, the over 9% average, which is already, of course, high historically by US standards. And there's a huge risk, of course, if people don't get opportunities, if they don't get jobs, and they continue with long-term unemployment, that that creates um, massive sort of structural, economic, and social problems um, on down the line. As I think, indeed, you can see from the Occupy Wall Street protests, from some of the protests that we've seen uh, overseas as well, this is about opportunity. Uh, it's about mobility. So I think that it's a really exciting and relevant conversation to have today. Um, so I'm going to sit down now, and I'm going to have our panelists uh, introduce themselves, and then I'm going to spend, just in the interest of time, I think about 20 minutes just having a lively back and forth with them, and then I'm going to open it up to questions, and there'll be, I hope, a microphone around somewhere, or you all can stand up and speak very loudly, um, and we can start getting some input from, from all of you, because I know many of you are experts in this topic as well. All right, so I'm going to start. Thanks, Rana. Uh, my name is Gerald Kirtavian. I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called Year Up, um, which is an intensive training and development program for low-income 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, we work in nine cities around the country and serve about 1,500 uh, young people, uh, helping to prepare them for a livable wage careers and post-secondary education. My name is Jane Owens. I'm the Assistant Secretary of Labor in the Obama administration. Uh, my area is in employment and training. I spent all of my life in some uh, way in education, and I'm a great special ed teacher. Uh, I have the Commissioner of Higher Ed in New Jersey uh, for under Governor Corzine, and uh, most relevantly, a longtime advisor to the late Senator Edward Kennedy. Okay. My name is Karen Williams, a uh, graduate of Year Up Boston, class of January 2010. I now currently work at State Street uh, doing mutual fund services and I'm also a part of Europe's Boston Board. My name is uh, John Galante. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Chase Wealth Management, J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I'm also the executive sponsor for J.P. Morgan Chase's uh, engagement with Europe. Uh, we've been involved with uh, Gerald and the Europe folks for the last five years and have sponsored a number of interns. Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Noel. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a graduate of Watson School. Uh, currently I'm working at a uh, nonprofit that I created as a model of college and that leads leadership to empowerment and action that I like. My name is Dorothy Stoneman. I'm the founder and president of New Build USA. Uh, which is a support center for 273 youth build programs in urban and rural communities around America, through which 110,000 young people have built 21,000 units of affordable housing while working toward their own high school diploma and GED, preparing for college and preparing careers. I'm one of those people, uh, like Mayor Bloomberg, who believes we should find what works and fund it to the max, and I believe that the, I, I've chosen this particular work because I believe in answer to John Bridgeland's question about what is the greatest lever uh, available. I think that if you take the 16 to 24 year olds who have fallen or been pushed off track or were born into those, uh, those zip codes where they were 
where they have obstacles in front of them and you give them the opportunity that they need and you do uh, what the uh, lady who just spoke to us said, find somebody who pays attention to them and follows them all the way through, showing the power of love, discipline, opportunity, <coughs> education, that we can break the cycle of poverty we can begin in one generation if we invest adequately. Stuart Thorne, President and CEO of South Park Company. If you went to the event at the Apollo Theater last night, uh, we're the ones who uh, innovated the uh, 12th Life program. <clears throat> In any case, our company is very actively engaged with uh, local educational systems, both at the high school level, technical school level, and the college level, to create win-win partnerships that allows us to develop our workforce and achieve very tangible, immediate economic benefits while also uh, helping the community achieve its goals and helping these students uh, achieve success as well. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Jennings. I'm with LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of you have seen it as the, uh, the businessman's Facebook. And I run the technology department there and uh, have been fortunate enough to take part in Europe as well and uh, have had interns work for me. Um, I have a two-prong approach here. One, we enjoy helping uh, Europe and uh, will continue to do so, but LinkedIn's focus is connecting talent with opportunity at a massive scale. So at corporate level, we're looking to try and you know, fill jobs uh, worldwide, and uh, so we've got a mission there that we're working on accomplishing as well. Okay, thanks to everybody, and thanks for keeping those brief uh, and succinct. So I'm going to start with the issue of education, because as, as probably everyone here knows, education is the, the fact that's most course, uh, closely correlated with mobility. And we've heard about this huge divide here in the number of um, undergraduate degrees that we have and those that are needed. But there are also other gaps, um, not just uh, for four-year degrees, but other types of education. So I think I'd like to start by getting the perspectives of of John, Stuart, and Michael, you're, you're at companies that are doing a lot of hiring. Um, maybe, John, you can start. Tell us, what do you see between what's out there and what you need, and, and what do you think could be done? I think, uh, so So we have, in, in particularly in the, in the technology sector, and I would say in the service, uh, servicing sector, we see lots of uh, openings and demand for uh, technology development, for service delivery components within technology development and for you know we, we just recently started a program with you up um, around our tellers in our branches um, and we you know have a lot of challenges filling those roles uh, in that the turnover rates maybe the person's not quite the right fit maybe they don't have enough of a service you know orientation and you're up does a does a fabulous job in preparing the interns, you know, in terms of educating them on how to operate in the corporate environment, what kind of service skills to, to you know, we, we need to bring to the uh, to the job market. So we just started a program where we actually are bringing in Europe interns to work six months in the in the branch network, which also happens to reflect the communities that we're in. Um, the the uh, you know then. Hopefully those those roles those those interns can turn into full time uh, positions over time. And once you have that kind of a foundation in place, you know there's lots of uh, upward opportunities beyond those particular jobs. I mean that's not the only place. We also have the same thing going on in technology. But but I think the advantage to JP Morgan Chase is we have a intern who's coming to work for us for a period of six months. We get to know them. They get to know us. We've also worked on the curriculum, preparing them uh, to, to get into uh, to the position and then take it to a full-time uh, position. So I think, I, I, I guess the bottom, you know, sort of line I, I want to get to is, I think there needs to be a lot more work done between the feeder systems, whether it's nonprofit or it's the public school system or even the college uh, uh, system and the corporate world to influence the curriculum mm -hmm. of those feeder systems in a way that aligns better with the demands that we have. That's interesting. So getting in at the ground floor really early on with what you need and making sure that those needs are met. That's right. Um, Stuart, let me ask you, because you work in a very different kind of a company, what's your perspective on this? 
Yeah, yeah. Southwire is a uh, company that makes things, and we've got 4,000 employees, 3,000 of them roughly uh, work on the production floor. Uh, of the 1,000 that don't, uh, you know, we, we pretty, we're pretty successful at recruiting uh, people who have higher levels of education in, in the various functions that we require. I would say our biggest challenge, and it's kind of ironic, is hiring people into our factories. And uh, not just warm bodies, but people who you know, graduated from high school, we have that requirement, and have a positive attitude toward the career they'd be pursuing on the production floor, and have um, an understanding of what it takes to work in that environment. It's a requirement that requires, uh, environment that requires a lot of discipline, hard work, um, and, and you know, a, a, a very positive attitude. So we particularly have been focusing, and 12 for Life is an example of that, on this population of kids who are on the cusp of either graduating or not graduating from high school. If we can help them graduate, uh, they become then accessible to us and, and you know, to work in our factories. And if we can help them graduate in a way where we build some vocational training on the way toward their high school degree, uh, they then come into the workforce with a sense that there really is an opportunity, there really is a career for them in manufacturing, even without further higher education, uh, a career path that, that they can pursue and, and successfully uh, uh, benefit society and also build uh, uh, successful lives for themselves and their families. So, uh, so getting a positive mindset at a uh, high school educated level uh, ready to pursue a career in manufacturing. If we can find those kinds of people or help create those kinds of people through cooperative programs with uh, local education, uh, that is like gold to us. Yeah. Stuart, let me ask you one quick follow up there. Do you see other models abroad, you know, perhaps like in Germany, where there's a much tighter integration of vocational training, uh, company, public private sector integration? What can we do there, do you think? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think uh, I'll, I'll look within our own uh, country. I think uh, just you know, a few decades ago, there was a uh, uh, a real, uh, uh, there was a strong vocational training system within our high schools, and it wasn't regarded as a sort of a loser career path. Mm -hmm. uh, kids who were involved in that had status and, and had self-respect and, and were given a sense of, of a career that they could pursue straight out of high school, and, uh, and were given training that allowed them to sort of go into that uh, prepared. So, you know, I think even within our own country, we, regardless of looking outside into other countries, uh, we can find examples of where we've had this mindset in the past, past. And I think we need to reinstate this mindset for the future. I, I think our country's become a little obsessed with going on to higher education as being the only path to success. It's certainly an important path to success, but, uh, but, there's, but that's an, an insurmountable goal for a lot of kids who are struggling as freshmen and sophomores in high school. They're struggling just to graduate from high school, let alone go to higher yeah. levels of education. So. I mean, particularly relevant when you consider the amount of student debt out there right now, which is, of course, a growing issue. Um, Michael, you work in technology. This is where we hear that the jobs are, but there's also a big bifurcation in technology jobs. There's a lot of high-end jobs, not so many in the middle. Um, tell us your perspective on this and the sort of skills that you need to and within your company. You know, it's interesting. There's three million jobs that are unfilled right now, and uh, a large number of those are in Silicon Valley. It's amazing how in the last two years, uh, the freeway I drive on to go to work every day is gridlocked. There are so many people working now, and there's still so many jobs that are unavailable. Um, we've got close to 2,000 people, and I have 300 openings right now in our company. Um, and uh, in my own department, uh, I've got 20 positions that are entry level that I can't fill. I'm having a hard time. These are entry level uh, positions as well. These are help desks. These are, these are people actually open up the boxes, open up computers, and to put them on desks. And it wasn't until, for example, Europe approached me that I knew that this was uh, an option for me. And uh, it was very beneficial. And I agree that not every job out there, even the Silicon Valley requires a full four-year degree. A lot of them do, of course, software engineering. But a lot of people, um, you wouldn't need any money just to actually get some skills that you needed to, uh, to move into some of the technology uh, spaces. Uh, you can start with a basic laptop and download open source software and actually train yourself. Um, there are mentoring programs that are out there as well. And uh, so, you know, what I look for, number one, is uh, aspiration. Someone who wants to work hard and do a good job, even without a degree. Um, that is what's worked out really well for me. So the interns that I had, I did bring on, uh, two of them got hired full time. One fella, um, 18 or 19 years old, went from not having any job, not knowing what to do, to figuring out how to deal with stock options in the offer letter. That was pretty impressive. 
And uh, so, you know, that's what I'm looking for. And so if there's more programs, more outreach programs, um, such as Europe that uh, reaches out to other small companies, medium companies, which is what we are, um, there's thousands of companies that are looking to build these kinds of positions. And uh, if we can just find the people with the skills, the talent, maybe you're a, uh, a designer, maybe uh, a graphic designer, and uh, there are positions out there for that. Um, just basic entry level telecom uh, guy who actually wants to write iPhone apps. And uh, there's a lot of information out there on how to do that at an entry level. And uh, those are the people I'm looking to hire. Okay. Well, I want to speak um, and hear now from, from uh, those that are training some of these young people, Gerald and Dorothy. When you have people coming into your programs, we've heard what John and Michael and others are looking for. What are the, the stress points? What are the challenges that you face? Um, the kind of top two or three biggest problems and how do you overcome them in terms of taking uh, a young person and putting them in a job at a place like J.P. Morgan or LinkedIn? I think it was uh, interesting, Ryan. The challenges are less uh, less to me about uh, a young person who's motivated and hardworking <coughs> come in and achieve their potential, which I think we're proving now over you know, many thousands of young people. I think one of the challenges is really two challenges. One is perception. Because uh, adults, employers, you know, we have enlightened folks like Mike and John and others in our panel and Stu. Um, many adults don't look at our urban young adults today and see assets. They're actually looking at young adults and seeing a liability or a deficit rather than a critical component of the U.S. economic engine. And so I would say that, that writ large is our employers signal that you come hardworking, motivated, as Mike said, motivated to learn. Uh, for employers to be signaling that yes, that is the type of talent we want, and we're not going to solely restrict that to a four-year degree. So there's that second perception overcomes that there's only one way to become an educated citizen in America, which is a four-year college degree. And very, very few Americans have that degree that they got between the ages of 18 and 22. The average age for Bachelor of Arts in America is 28 years old. So it's having the, the expectation and the perception change that our young adults are critical components of their economic engine. And given an appropriate opportunity, they will not only surprise you, they are your future employees and the future leaders of your company. I actually put more responsibility on the uh, adults mm -hmm. in the system rather than the young adults in terms of what the real challenges are for our society. Dorothy, do you agree? Very much. Uh, uh, I always love to listen to Gerald because he, I think he speaks for all of us so well. Uh, I think uh, we have not, in Youth Build, uh, made the same linkages with the kind of employers that are represented here in the corporate sector. We've worked more on the construction sector, the nonprofit, and the service sector because we focus on developing community leadership. So uh, what I'm happy to hear about the need, and we will make some, some of these linkages. Uh, I think one of the obstacles, and I agree totally that the talent of the young people, the intelligence, the will, the motivation exists, and that's why we keep doing this, because it's so, uh, it's so rewarding and so exciting to see young people seize an opportunity, work hard, climb that ladder, and take uh, whatever doors are open and go through them. Uh, some of the doors are not so open. And you have to work very hard uh, uh, to get into unions. You had to work very hard in the recent period because the construction industry is not hiring. Uh, it used to be easier. A third of the young people would go into construction pretty easily. Uh, we've had to work hard to overcome the internalized uh, uh, hopelessness that the young people come in with and they do not expect go to college. 93% of you <coughs> students have left high school without a diploma, and they basically say it's because nobody cared about them there, didn't know their names, and if they ran into any difficulties, there was no way to get help. Uh, so we have to completely reverse that and offer a sufficient amount of respect, individual attention, caring support, and the uh, awareness that actually you can do anything you want to, you can go to college, and we're going to open that door by taking you to college, bridging the, uh, the gap, take courses on, uh, on the college campus. And so the minute young people have adults telling them, actually, you can do this, and I will help you, and here's how you do it, suddenly the college access goes radically up from 15% to 42% in our most recent experiments. So uh, 
the, the lack of bridging between community colleges and four-year colleges and the feeder systems is something that we've been working successfully to overcome, but it's still an obstacle across the board. Okay, thank you. That was a good summary. Um, Jane, I want to give you a chance to speak from the government perspective on all of this. Um, a couple of things that are, that are very interesting to me. I know that there's there's been a lot of talk around the youth unemployment problem since the financial crisis and recession began. There's also been a lot of political gridlock in Washington, and it's been difficult for us to do things. What do you feel has been done that you're proud about and that you'd like to see more of, but also what's on your sort of wish list um, for the next few years? Well, I think first of all, uh, when this administration came in, the decision was to raise the bar. Uh, that previously with the Department of Labor, we never demanded of our grantees that they offer training that led to an industry-recognized credential or put people on a death wage and degree. That's a waste of tax taxpayers' money. That's training people for jobs that don't exist. We also made a commitment to begin and end with employers. So it doesn't matter uh, for our department, success was before how many you enrolled, not how many you placed in jobs. So that our direction has been much more about meeting with employers at the front end, figuring out with them, just as uh, John described, figuring out as Gerald has been doing, how you build a curriculum that they'll honor and respect so they'll hire your graduates. And you know, I think for some of our uh, formula grantees or long-term grantees like the Youth Build program and Job Corps, uh, they were very willing, in Dartmouth's case, Youth Build was very willing to upgrade their curriculum. I mean, uh, to, to start thinking about, Youth Build has always had people that went on to four-year colleges and has always <coughs> had people, in fact, I met some that are PhDs today. But, so I don't want to say we started that with them, but raising the bar for everyone, <coughs> making the mathematics that students take more rigorous. Uh, so, and, and in our job corps program, it's the same thing. I mean, again, 16 to 24 year old low income kids shouldn't graduate unless they can meet business standards, that they can be work ready and college ready. Now, in terms of wish list, I mean, I think we need to break down the silos. Right now, really fabulous programs like Year Off and Youth Build and other programs are fighting over government crumbs. You know, they're trying to figure out a way. And these are two programs who haven't lost sight of their mission. They don't apply for any money just to get funded, but there are some entities out there, some faith-based and community organizations that are so resource starved that they forget their core mission and apply for any money just to get money. So, I mean, I think we've got to figure out a way to, to do just what we've been charged with today, to say thank you very much to those programs that aren't performing, and it's going to be tough mm -hmm. because they're faith-based programs, they're long-term community programs, but they aren't getting the 21st century results. They aren't getting kids ready for uh, post-secondary education, and they aren't getting kids ready for real sustainable jobs. So we've got to say to them, you've got to partner with some of these other programs, maybe provide some of the follow-up or wraparound programs, but not be the deliverer of core service anymore, because it's just not working right now. And then we have to put more money into the programs that are working. And as Dorothy can tell you, I mean, we live by results. You know, we really look at outcome measures. And if people aren't making quarterly outcome measures, grantees, we're calling them and saying, what can we do? What will pull your money back? Because if we can't live in a world where mediocrity is acceptable with taxpayers' money. So that's my goal. Strong result orientation. Okay. Well, I want to make sure we give the younger people uh, on the panel a, a chance to speak as well. Um, Karen, Noe, I'd like to hear what you consider personally to have been your biggest <coughs> challenges um, in terms of opportunity and mobility, and you know a little bit of context in, in the programs you've been in and how that's helped you to, to move forward. Kermit, maybe you can start. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so for myself, I mean, first just getting access to opportunity to, to begin with. So I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, so I was an immigrant. Um, just being able to get a social security number and be a legal citizen, that was the first then after that, I think it was more of a mental process of having the confidence in myself to, to believe that I do belong at State Street, I can be successful, and just uh, developing that confidence in myself to, to take advantage of the year of programs. And I think also, uh, well, one thing that was really tough for me was, was the separation between myself and my peers. Uh, that's something that, you know, we talk about the pathway to prosperity, and we have these great institutions like uh, Year Up and, and Youth Build, but a lot of the times the individual that's walking the path gets lost. You, you, you're, you're changing your life in, in a sense, so that's a very tough period for someone to go through, and, and just that separation from your peers when you start to wear a suit and you speak differently and you said, Gerald, 
coach and team and just, just my mentor. No, I don't want to do those things anymore. That's tough and that can affect how you perform in the program and in your internship as well. So those are some of the challenges for me, but you know, uh, I was thankful to have mentors and to have supportive staff and advisors who, who were helping me to, to make that uh, successful transition. Yeah, what do you think? Do you agree with all that?
absolutely. I think I, I really do believe that uh, the apprenticeships, the internships, is definitely the way to go. I, I, you know, we have a program that just as we have a program at Year Up, we also have a program at Syracuse University. Again, we were getting college graduates into, you know, we were recruiting them into our programs on technology and operations, and they didn't have in many cases the right skills. So we want to influence, we work with Syracuse to influence their curriculum to fit our needs. And now we've, we've actually built a little nice cycle because we have some of the Year Up graduates who, we, we actually have a presence on the Syracuse campus where we actually pay interns to do different uh, R&D workforce or testing workforce or things like that. So we've actually had over the last few years four Year Up graduates who are now going that route and are now earning as part-time JP Morgan Chase employees on the Syracuse campus while they're going to school with, with, with the, to get a four-year degree. But I, but I really do think, I also want to sort of hit a point that I think Jane made before, you know, which was within an employee, within JP Morgan Chase, we have a lot of different nonprofits coming out, of, coming at us. And it, it's very, to some extent, very confusing. So the more we can do to complement the efforts of each other and not compete with each other, the better served we're going to be. So, so one of the things that we, we just started to do recently was bring some of those nonprofits that we already have relationships with together. So we've had Perscolis, Empower, Year Up. We've had some veteran organizations that, that we work with, as well as some of the youth you know, year up organizations that said, okay, how do we divide and conquer? What types of skills are we looking for? What's the profile of these feeder organizations? And how do we align things better so that we can basically get the right results and okay. get the right people into the right job? Okay, well, we only have about um, 18 minutes left, so the interest to give everyone a chance to ask questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start taking from the audience. Um, over here, I'm not sure if we actually have a mic. If not, just stand up and... Okay. Oh, is there a mic over there? Are people going to bring it down? Or? Oh, you can, or you can step over there then. If, um, there may be. You know what? Why don't you try standing up? Go ahead, and tie there, because you can try <laughs> standing up and just speak loudly. We're um, on. My question is actually for um, Ms. Orgas and Mr. Williams. And I'd like to know, we heard Ms. Doman and Mr. Tertinian, um speak a lot about the drive that is within young adults, that, that we need more adults to accept. Um, and I want to know, it, you, you talked a little bit more about the separation and, and coming out of that, that culture that I'm not exactly sure um, how to describe that, but I wanted to know what made the difference for you two as young people and what facilitated your ability to really engage, um, like getting away from your peers that may have been negative influences on you. Karen, do you want to start? Uh, first of all, that's a great question. I think for me, it was really finding my passion. So my junior year of high school, I got introduced to the NIFTY program in Network to teach in entrepreneurship. And I found that I love business, I love entrepreneurship. I was like, wow, you can do something you love and make money at the same time. It was no different of uh, what I was doing uh, prior to that. And I think it was really my passion that started to drive, you know, at, to the point where I was like, you know what, I, I really don't care what you guys think about me anymore because this is something that I really want to do. This is something that I love. And you know, regardless of what, if, if you choose to be my friend or not, that, that's up to you, but this is the path that I choose to go down. So I think it's really about finding something that the young adults and youth are really passionate about and using that as a driving force. And just, you know, there's, there's uh, the, the bright spots of, of innovation opportunity that Temple Village is awesome. I'm looking for like, these, these are some nonprofits I've never even heard of in my own backyard where if you can connect young adults to a, a cooking program or a program like you to, to find something that they're really passionate about that they can tap into and really pull out that potential that they naturally have. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? You want anyone, do you want to say a couple words? Um, I mean, when I was eight, I saw blood on the floor with a sketch of a body. And I didn't know what it was. I sat down and thought about it and it was dead person. I knew then that I didn't want to be a part of something that, that was going to cause that type of body. Being able to um, be that young and to recognize that just transformed my whole path. 
didn't work out to the path that it was supposed to be, but they eventually left the conference. Um, the gang is are not part of my life, but I was able to remove myself from that, and I was able to keep my brother out of that, which is my biggest accomplishment, because that was my dream for um, I mean, yeah. I, I think the biggest, the biggest um, obstacle of, with the, with this whole process is to understand that listening to everybody is, is positive. It's, it's a positive thing to hear that jobs are available and, and people want to want to work with with organizations like these for the Bureau. But we gotta we gotta look at this as a, as an emergency. This is a crisis for us. Um, so let's expand this and if, if we can strategize with, with corporations to be able to see how we could make a curriculum that fits both the needs of the nonprofit and the needs of the corporation, then let's do that. But let's start doing it right away because we're talking about planning, at the same time people are dying and people are getting frustrated. And those are the two things that are basically killing our country. We know you have the passion, the skill, the entrepreneurial uh, ability, and here's how you really do it. And when we combine the federal funding with the knowledge and with the support, then those local community-based organizations can perform, but not if you leave them alone to just sort of, you know, swim or, mm -hmm. or sink. Okay. Uh, and so we want to engage the power that exists in the local community. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I haven't given that much love to this side of the room. There's a lady here who's been waiting for a while to mic. Excuse me, I'm using the mic because I have a cold, but um, I want to thank the panelists for your perspectives on youth. But I want to ask a question that really gets to the heart of what's happening to the rest of the population in this country, which is older workers. Um, there are one in six older adults living in poverty in this country. Uh, there are over two million older adults who need and want to get back to work because of what's happened. Uh, you know, the, since the Great Recession, <coughs> over one in seven, uh, well, the, the unemployment rate has gone up to 7%, the highest it's been since the Great Depression for the older population. You may not have been given a charge of sort of looking across the generations uh, with regard to this whole issue of unemployment. But what I see represented uh, today is what I would call a wonderful tri-sector collaborative. You've got government, you've got the not-for-profit sector, you've got uh, you know, businesses all engaged in addressing the, the issue of youth unemployment. But if you look 
look to the future, we have 78 million baby boomers for whom the, the issue of retirement is going to be huge and they're going to need to work. What about that population? Is there anyone who'd like to take that one, Gerald? Well, the, or it's one that we work on all the time. And it's very interesting because I think all the business people at the table would tell you that older workers are not retired. You know, their 401ks are, are not what they thought they would be. Many of them took out home equity loans to send their children to college or to re-educate themselves, and they can't sell their house. They're less mobile than young people, so they can't, for instance, move to Syracuse for a job, the city, you know, uh, with, I'm uh, sorry, J.P. Morgan Chase, not to think of what they are saying. Sorry. Uh, but I think what the other parallel here that really has to be looked at is if the, the, the plight of the older worker is putting more pressure on young people because older workers who did retire or were forced to retire are taking jobs that historically have been jobs for young people in retail and fast food. You go into a fast food restaurant today, you see more gray-headed people than you ever saw before because they're taking those kinds of jobs to supplement their social security. So I think that's not odd to look at these together. And I will give you a statistic that will not probably surprise you, but will scare everyone else. Workers over 55 are more likely to be long-term unemployed than any other category of worker, regardless of their educational level. So if you are a 60-year-old <coughs> worker, it really doesn't matter whether you have a high school diploma or a PhD, you're likely to, twice as likely to be out of work three times as long because of your age. So it, wow. it, it, there are a lot of statistics in that that scare you about bias against older workers, just as we have bias against young people because they have ink. You know what I mean? So I think, I think it's really an interesting thing to look at them in parallel. That's fascinating and, and scary. Um, now, we're not going to be able to answer everyone's questions, so I want to apologize. I'm going to take one, possibly two more, and then I'm sure people will be available later if, if you want to follow up. I'm going to take from the lady here in the pink one. Hi. I mean, my question is for a gentleman from J.P. Morgan, and really for everyone on the panel, but uh, I think I think, you know, I, I'm uh, very proud of the, the banking industry and my bank in particular. And, you know, we are continuing, continuously investing in the communities, um, working with veterans, working with disabled, working with, you know, uh, underprivileged, uh, disadvantaged folks. So I, you know, reconcile the issues with how, how do we continue to build a stronger workforce? How do we continue to build a stronger economy? And how do we balance what we're doing for the community with what we're doing from a commercial point of view? So I, I really, you know, I'm very proud of what we're doing. Uh, you know, when I see things like um, the, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street, um, I've been in uh, the, uh, financial industry for 32 years. I sympathize with the frustration and the difficulties that are out there, but 99.9% .9 of the people that I've worked with in those 32 years are hardworking, uh, ex you know, people who are very committed to their communities, are very committed to their careers, have worked really hard to get where they are. So I really do think that there's a balance to, to what we're trying to do here. Um, and I think, unfortunately, to some extent, the, ind the banking industry has been, uh, you know, vilif vilified uh, with, with some of the things that have played. Okay. I'm going to take one final question way in the back there. Hi. Thank you. I can predict. And I'll be <laughs> very succinct. We're from the Coalition for Responsible Community Development. We're a South LA youth build contractor. <laughs> Hi, Noli. How are you? Quick question. The city of Los Angeles is in a crisis. And we have several challenges. I won't go into the after, but I will ask all of the private sector representatives, what advice can you give us on going around 
these, all of these insurmountable obstacles to building strong coalitions, like she mentioned, tri coalitions with government. At this point, we kind of want to let them solve their problems and work with more people like South Wires if they even exist. Southern California has lost a lot of its key players. Northwood Grumman left, closed its offices. So how would you give us a good strategy? Okay, Stuart, do you want to start? Then Michael, I want to hear from you on that as well. Yeah, very simple, open up a dialogue with us. I mean, I think that uh, uh, companies, and I, it's not just Southwire, I, I know a lot of CEOs in, in my industry, uh, we're very open to ideas uh, from the community in terms of how to work together. And uh, sometimes I think there's an unnecessary reticence to, to come together and, and create a dialogue, but we're, we're always very open to uh, any ideas that will help us become more successful. And, and if we can help other, other people become more successful simultaneously, you know, that's the win-win we're after. So I just encourage you to, to you know, be heard, come directly to us. Okay, Michael, do you want to comment? Uh, I actually have to second what Stuart just mentioned. Um, you know, today, with social media especially, um, you see, you know, um, join my Facebook page or <clears throat> on LinkedIn, you can join different groups. Um, you are your own brand. You have to make your own identity. You can actually create a profile very easily, very free on, on LinkedIn. And you can reach out to a CEO of a company. You can reach out to community outreach um, uh, folks at companies. We have one. Um, most of the companies around have them as well and uh, start a dialogue and to say, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what we're trying to do, and um, you can have members of your community actually go ahead and, and join groups, and then we can start the dialogue free of charge and uh, very easily. Um, uh, you can go to any library and set this up. And so that's uh, some of the tools that we're trying to build to aid that um, communication uh, to take place. And so um, reaching out, I, I haven't heard from anybody except for a year up, and that's the one I jumped on. So if there's others that were out there, I'd be happy to talk to them. Gerald, do you want to? Yeah, I, I would say that it's really the onus is on, on both. Although having worked with you know 200 plus organizations across the country, um, rather than say to those organizations, here's what I have, to really start the conversation says, what do you need? And to understand they have needs, they have imperatives, they're trying to build a business in a very competitive, globally competitive environment. And just to say, first of all, let me understand what you need, and then let's just do a deal. If I can give you what you need, will you give us a chance? And I think there's been a, uh, a part of the industry of preparing young people for work. There's been, a, a, at times, a lack of understanding the needs of someone in the business sector. And at times, the business sector doesn't think that nonprofit can produce the quality of person. So there's, I think both sides can move closer to one another, but I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't uh, remove the need for the nonprofits out here to be a little more attentive to what the needs are of business in our society. Okay, well, I'm gonna just wrap up um, by kind of echoing a few themes, which I was asked to do as I'm listening to all of you here and our panelists. And what we're hearing, I'm hearing that we need better feeder systems for talent, um, that we need programs where you can learn as you earn, that people shouldn't be prejudging workers and what they may or may not be able to accomplish, that we need cooperation rather than competition, and also that we need to be looking ahead rather than behind. So those seem to be some of the key themes here. Obviously, we could do a lot more, but I'm sure you all will keep talking about it for the conference. And thank you, everyone, for your time, and thank you to panelists.